Let me switch over. Hi. Um, I hope you guys can still hear me just fine. Let me switch where I am. Make it over here. There we go. Um, I'll put this over here. Okay, you can hear me just fine. Uh, what was the grade? So I'm gonna... Oh, I haven't even started yet, Elf. Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Um, context for this presentation actually is... Uh, so I'm a huge Lord of Rings fan. Um, I recently uh, actually was just awarded um, a Master of Letters in Fantasy Literature. Um, so I have a Master's in Fantasy Literature. Uh, and during my Master's program, there was this one guy I got into a fight with. Uh, an argument with. I didn't like him um, because he insisted that you couldn't read Sam and Frodo as queer when we were making jokes about them, you know, being real gay for each other. Uh, and so I decided when it was time for my presentation time, I knew we were both going to be talking about Lord of the Rings. So I picked the same presentation day as... And let me look at the camera. I picked the same presentation day as him. Um, gave my presentation, got a 98% on it, which is kind of unheard of. Um, my professor said it sparked one of the most interesting class discussions he's ever been privy to. Uh, and his presentation bombed. Um, so it was a big fuck you to him. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Signature Charlie Power Slam. So, yeah, I, I did well with this, but I haven't given this presentation in a while, and I also haven't practiced. It's been over a year, so please forgive me. So, hi, I'm Enemy Charlie, and this is uh, Bag Ends a Queer Place, and it's Folks Are Queer, reading Frodo and Sam as queer. This is a slide I added today just to keep myself organized. Um, this is essentially... Uh, how things are going to go. We're going to talk about the historical context for both um, the author as well as the uh, basis of Sam and Frodo's relationship. I'm going to provide some textual evidence and um, analyze their relationship. Um, I'm going to address some counter arguments uh, and then I'm going to talk about the importance of um, maybe not necessarily reading them as queer but being open to queer readings. So I'm, I also will not probably be looking at chat. I'm just going to be talking. Um, opening it with some memes, but uh, I feel like it's important to address, like, essentially why I'm talking about this. But um, obviously, when The Lord of the Rings came out, there were a lot of jokes about Sam and Frodo being queer. It came out during a time when homophobia was still very rampant. Not that it's not rampant now, because my fucking God, look at what's happening to our country. Um, so, you know. Uh, we have this quote here, none of us had seen a movie on the big screen where men hold each other, comfort each other, kiss each other's foreheads. Early 2000s preteen America was a time of gay jokes, of no homo, of mocking voices and slurs, um, and secret punitive violence enacted in the locker room against anyone who had a whiff of otherness. In that world, the Lord of the Rings trilogy stood out as deeply earnest and therefore vulnerable, hence all the gay jokes. Uh, and then we have a meme here. Um, and I would like to mention, by the way, uh, Peter Jackson's version of Lord of the Rings was way more heterosexual than the actual canon, which you will see. All right, so now we're going to talk about Tolkien, the author. Um, so he was a white Englishman and Roman Catholic, staunch Roman Catholic, writing during the early 20th century. Um, homosexuality was illegal in the UK until 1967. He was in a happy heterosexual marriage, so he himself was heterosexual. He never expressed any views on homosexuality, um, other than to say he had not heard the word um, until he was 19. Uh, however, he was friends with openly gay poet um, W.H. Auden and queer writer Mary Renault. Those were friends of his. Um, he was an officer in World War I and lost all but one of his friends uh, in the war. So he placed a very high value on friendship and he himself was extremely anti-war. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, historical inspirations for um, Sam and Frodo's relationship. Uh, so Tolkien based the relationship between Sam and Frodo off the relation between an officer and his Batman. Um, a Batman in World War I was a soldier, uh, usually like lower class because um, 
rank in World War I in England was largely uh, awarded based on class and education. So Batman was generally a lower class person um, who uh, not only fought, but also essentially took care of an officer, took on like rather feminine roles, essentially. So like cooking, cleaning, um, knitting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Tolkien really admired these Batmen. Um, he, as an officer, Tolkien himself was an officer. He thought of them as superior to him because of their, you know, they were just cool guys, cool guys with a lot of love. Um, so during this time, uh, like during war, and this is actually pretty common historically, um, it was desirable and expected for men to bond um, and to essentially, uh, and it is better actually if you are fighting a war for your soldiers to love each other and want to take care of each other. Um, so that was important. Uh, and it was also an all-male environment, so roles that were considered feminine were taken on by men. Um, it was also a uh, really interesting time for queer men, because for the first time ever in their lifetimes, and in the past, you know, however many years, um, queer men and men who were attracted to men actually had an opportunity to have relationships with each other, um, to be in close quarters with each other, to go off and, you know, diddle each other. Uh, and there's at least one novel about a Batman and his officer having a romantic relationship. Um, and many accounts of queer soldiers who found they could, while facing nightmarish conditions in the trenches, live out relationships that would have been impossible at home. So while it was a terrible uh, time, it was ideal for queer men, kind of. Uh, and this is also kind of consistent throughout history. Uh, if Crisis is here, um, she can attest to the fact that kind of like the gold rush era of uh, California um, was actually really ideal to be a queer person in. Um, you could kind of just do whatever. The Wild West had no rules. Uh, pretty cool, except for like the, you know, kind of side of. So, making the best of a bad circumstance, I guess. And now we're going to talk about the evolution of their relationship. Um, so this is a quote from Jane Chance. Um, so, Sam initially serves as gardener before the quest begins, but he becomes a squire to his lord in the Two Towers after they are separated from the Fellowship, and eventually, in Return of the King, uh, it evolves into a deeply compassionate friend whose love transcends the ordinary. So, um, Sam, and, uh, Sam and Frodo had a master-servant relationship. Sam would have been the Batman, Frodo the officer. Um, Sam is a lower-class hobbit who works as his gardener, admires uh, Frodo and Bilbo, who pay him and his father very well, and treat them kindly, treat them like people. And Frodo is a high-class hobbit. Um, they don't have nobility. Uh, the hobbits are based off of uh, Victorian, late Victorian England uh, countryside society. Um, sorry, I'm allowing things. Also, hi, unstupefied. Unstupefied, Rocco's back, Rocco's back. Um, okay, so master and servant. I've provided some quotes here. Uh, so Sam is obviously very productive of Frodo. Um, we have this quote here. Don't you leave him, the elves said to me. Leave him, I said. I never mean to. I'm going with him. If he climbs to the moon and if any of those black riders try to stop him, they'll have Sam Gamgee to reckon with. Um, and this is after, this is before they have set up on their journey. Um, and obviously at this point, Gandalf had said to Sam, like, Bitch, take care of him. Take care of Frodo. Um, and then this is after Frodo has been uh, stabbed by one of the Nazgul. Um, and Sam busts into his room, grabs his left hand awkwardly and shyly. He stroked it gently, and then he blushed and turned hastily away. Um, so, you know, they're it's closer than a mere you know, master-servant relationship, but they're not quite there. And I would mark this, this part right here as kind of the turning point in their relationship where Frodo begins to see Sam as like a, more of a companion than just like a Batman. Um, so this is uh, when they're in Lothlorien and uh, Sam has met elves for technically the third time. Um, and Sam 
Uh, Frodo asks Sam, what do you think of elves now, Sam? Sam says, I reckon there's elves and elves. They're all elvish enough, but they're not all the same. Now these folks here seem to belong here, more even than hobbits do in the Shire. Whether they've made the land or the land's made them, it's hard to say if you take my meaning. If there's any magic about it, it's right down deep where I can't lay my hands on it, in a manner of speaking. So this is kind of where Frodo begins to see Sam as, uh, you know, more of an equal, a companion. Um, and this is obviously when Frodo is uh, going to go off to Mordor on his own, and Sam is like, fuck no, jumps in the little canoe and goes after him. Um, and so then, at this point, uh, you know, they've only interacted within the context of the Fellowship. And then in the Two Towers, uh, and in The Return of the King, it turns into essentially this slow, pathetic, desperate crawl to Mordor, through Mordor. Um, and this is the real quest, the real struggle in Lord of the Rings, never mind the wars. Um, and this is where they become companions. Uh, and here you are, Squidbit. Top 10 gayest Sam and Frodo moments, which I'm just going to read out. Um, here we go. Frodo's face was peaceful. The marks of fear and care had left it, but it looked old, old and beautiful. Sam shook his head as if finding words useless and murmured, I love him. He's like that and sometimes it shines through somehow, but I love him, whether or no. Um, and this is when uh, Shelob um, is kind of savaging uh, Frodo. And it says, Sam charge. No onslaught more fierce was ever seen in the savage world of beasts where some desperate small creature armed with little teeth alone will spring upon a tower of horn and hide that stands above its fallen mate. Um, this is interesting because this uh, David uh, LaFontaine noted that this actually resembles um, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Sam looked on the bright point of the sword. This is when Sam thinks Frodo is dead, by the way. Um, Sam looked on the bright point of the sword. He thought of the places behind where there was, bla where there was a black brink and an empty fall into nothingness. So much like uh, Romeo, when he comes across, Juliet goes, you know, maybe I'll kill myself. Maybe I won't. Um, and this is when uh, he's kind of attempting to get to Frodo once he realizes he's alive. Uh, it goes, in that hour of trial, it was the love of his master that helped him most to hold firm. Um, and this is when he, uh, they're essentially approaching the mountain. Um, and at this time, uh, Frodo has been, uh, you know, weakened severely. Uh, the ring is getting to him, it's getting in his head. He's essentially becoming what Gollum is. Um, although hobbits are uniquely uh, immune to the ring, uh, it's only an immunity. It's not like total immunity, it's only partial. So he's being worn down. Um, so, lying down, he tried to comfort Frodo with his arms and body. Then sleep took him, and the dim light of the last day of their quest found them side by side. So, Frodo was sleeping in Sam's arms. Um, Sam looked at him and wept in his heart, but no tears came to his dry and singing eyes. I said I'd carry him if it broke my back, he muttered, and I will. Come, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. So, loving and supporting each other, as men do in war. Um... And then uh, this is when Frodo is, you know, feeling compelled to turn on the ring and is begging Sam to help him. He says, help me, Sam. Help me, Sam. Hold my hand. I can't stop it. Sam took his master's hand and laid them together, palm to palm, and kissed them. And then he held them gently between his own. Um, and this isn't really, a, well, this is, a, this is a gay moment, certified gay moment. But this also, uh, this sentence usually makes me cry. And even when I was reviewing this, when I was talking about it, I did start crying a little bit. Um, and Gwahir is the, the king of the eagles, by the way. Um, and so it was that Gwahir saw them with his keen, far-seeing eyes, two small dark figures, forlorn, hand in hand, upon a little hill. Um, so they are laying, after they have tossed the ring into Mount Doom, they are laying hand in hand together, waiting to die. Um, by the way, for people who say, why didn't they just send the eagles in the first place to take the ring to Mordor? Because Sauron was a big fucking eye that would have shot them out of the fucking sky. Don't be stupid. They needed to draw the orcs out of Mordor and then have two people creep in there. It had to be a sneak attack, not a war waged against it. Um, and then finally, separation. Um, contextually, this is, uh, oh, um, this is when they uh, return to the Shire. And for some time, things are okay. Um, Sam wants to get married, but feels guilty. 
uh, kind of because he feels like he's abandoning Frodo. And so Sam says, I feel torn in two, as you might say. I see, said Frodo, but you want to get married, and yet you want to live with me in Bag End too. But my dear Sam, how easy. Get married as soon as you can and move in with Rosie. There's room enough in Bag End for as big a family as you could wish for. So after the marriage, um, they remain together. Um, and then when they go to essentially say goodbye to like a lot of notable people, um, this is, I think, when the last ship, actually, I think this is the last ship um, to Arisea, uh Sam realizes he's going. Um, and uh, Frodo is telling Sam that he can't come. Not yet. Uh, the ring bearers do get a pass, and because Sam did bear the ring for a time, he does get a pass, but he says, no, Sam, not yet anyway, not further than the Havens, though you too were a ring bearer, if only for a little while. Your time may come. Do not be too sad, Sam. You cannot always be torn in two. You will have to be one and whole for many years. You have so much to enjoy and to be and to do. Um, and so in this sense, uh, Sam is kind of torn in two between his need to maintain the, uh, you know, kind of a heteronormative hobbit life and also his love and dedication to Frodo, who is dealing with what is clearly post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, then we have uh, other evidence, um, which I'm going to talk, this is just context, but uh, Frodo himself was a lifelong bachelor. Um, as uh, La Fontaine says here, um, Frodo Baggins is a confirmed bachelor who, like his older relative Bilbo Baggins, uh, possesses the characteristics of a lonely homosexual man who has made a comfortable life for himself in a world where finding love is not an option. Um, lifelong bachelors historically tend to be gay people. It's gay dudes. Um, and then we have, uh, I don't know if y'all know about this, Baron and Luthien. Um, so the story of Baron and Luthien is essentially Tolkien's great romance that he wrote. Um, it was so important to him that he, um, he, his gravestone and his wife's gravestone, on his it's Baron, and on hers it's uh, Luthien is, is inscribed into it. And essentially, um, Baron is a human man, Luthien a human woman, um, and there's parallels in their tale between uh, Baron and Luthien and Sam and Frodo. So Baron also has an impossible quest, which is for Frodo, taking the ring to Mordor, and Luthien also insists on accompanying him. Like Frodo, Baron is trapped in a tower by his enemies. Like Sam, Luthien sings to find him, and he answers her. Baron loses a hand, Frodo loses a finger. The vial of Galadriel that Frodo bears was made with light from a star formed by the object of Baron's quest. So parallels there. Um, and this, I think, is the most telling. Tolkien notes in another letter, The greatest of romances do not tell of the happy marriage of such great lovers, but of their tragic separation. And... As we can see here, this is an extremely tragic separation. Um, but we are going to have to talk about the marriage. So let's talk about the marriage. Because um, you might say, Charlie, how can you be like saying that they're gay when, when Sam gets straight married? And the purpose of Sam marrying Rose is that um, it's they, there needed to be an integration back into Hobbit community. There needed to be a winding down um, and it's, uh, you know, as he said, to the theme of the relation of ordinary life and quest sacrifice causes and the longing for elves. So, like, the rustic love between Sam and Rosie is important because integration back into society. Um, Frodo, however, cannot return. He cannot, and there needs to be a parallel between Frodo and Sam here. Sam can come back to Hobbit life. He's fine. Uh, but Frodo is too wounded. He is too traumatized. Um, he cannot integrate back into society, just like a lot of, you know, soldiers that Tolkien knew, both, uh, you know, post-World War I and post-World War II, could not integrate back into society. Um, so there's that balance there. This is also the most telling here. Um, so this is a quote from the unpublished tale. So this was never published in Tolkien's lifetime, but was afterwards. Uh... This is Sam talking to uh, his daughter. Um, Celeborn, by the way. Celeborn and Galadriel, elf couple. Um, Galadriel left to, you know, go across the sea. Uh, Celeborn stayed, even though they were married for a very long time. Um, 
and uh, the daughter says, I think it was very sad for him. And for you, dear Sam dad, her hand felt for his and his brown hand clasped her slender fingers. For your treasure went too. I am glad Frodo of the Ring saw me, but I wish I could remember seeing him. Um, your treasure went too. I'm sure Sam loved his wife, but that was his treasure. Frodo is his treasure. Uh, and then here we have the obvious counter-argument, but Tolkien didn't intend for it to be gay. Uh, probably not. In fact, I'm certain he did not intend for it to be gay. But, in Tolkien's own words, um, I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purpose domination of the author. So Tolkien was very against people reading his texts as allegory, as them saying, this is the intentional message in my text. His, his intention with The Lord of the Rings was to write a bunch of, develop a bunch of fucking languages. That was the intention. Um, which he did, but people would often say, oh, it's about this, he wrote it about this, and he's saying, no, you can apply things to it, but it's, you know, whatever you want it to be. You have the freedom as a reader. So, oh yeah, Beard, that's correct. Um, I mean, I think there's obvious, but it's not an allegory. It's inspired, but not an allegory, uh, or some parts of it are inspired. I mean, you can't write outside of the experiences that have shaped your life or your own cultural context um because that's all you know um counter argument friendship between men were just more affectionate in tolkien's time yes however uh, i'm just going to read off these quotes male friendship was an important model of expression for men who felt themselves attracted to other men homoerotic poetry of the late 19th century celebrated friendship between men as the highest form of love um, intense male friendship provided a language through which homosexual men experience and explain their feelings, even to the extent of elevating them to a divine status. It is the indeterminate nature of the homosocial relationship that is unfamiliar and disturbing to some readers who want to slide their eyes away from what is actually being resented, represented and to ask, usually, for clearly defined, fully formed heterosexual relationships at the center of the narrative. So, people who are very against this, um, well, one, there's a historical context of, like, uh, queer men have historically uh, expressed their romantic love for other men um, through poems, stories about friendship. Friendship. Not always, but sometimes. Um, but also, I think, if you are resistant to such readings, even just the possibility of it, to say plainly, there's no way you can read that in it. Uh, again, I think Small here is correct in saying that um, it is disturbing to readers who want clearly defined, fully formed heterosexual relationships at the center of the narrative. They are uncomfortable with things that they don't understand and things that do not fit into a very narrow and close-minded worldview. Um, people who aren't very smart. In my little onion. Um, and then this is, this is actually, because, okay, the history of, um, the word homosexuality and sexuality uh, within like American and European uh, thought has changed drastically. Um, sexuality before, there was like back during, until like I think the Victorian era, there was no concept of something as like sexuality in the sense where it was an identity. Uh, your sexuality depended on the acts that you committed. Um, Sexuality was an act. The words homosexual, heterosexual did not exist. They did not conceptually exist. Um, there were some sex acts that were okay, such as uh, a man having sex with a woman or a man penetrating another man's butthole. Um, and there was sex that was not okay, which was uh, any sex a woman might have with anyone outside of the confines of um, heterosexual marriage and a dude taking it up the butt. Bad news bears. So sexuality wasn't an identity. Um, however, uh, some people have proposed, rather than if we say these characters, these people, historical figures, were homosexual, um, we, rather than argue essentially like, oh, they, were they friends? Were they lovers? Were they friends? Were they lovers? We could say, who cares? 
um, and settle on homoamory. They were homoamorous. So I'm going to read this. The anachronistic use of contemporary terms such as heterosexuality, homosexuality, homoeroticism, and even friendship, love, and desire can be simultaneously problematic and potentially productive. Unlike homosexuality or homoeroticism, the term homoamory is not yet anchored to and burdened by signification. It implies something different, a something in the overlapping of friendship and eros. This something is not already understood and known as sex nor as friendship. Love may be the more precise term, yet homoamory gives space for a reader to supply the dimensions of this love. Um, whatever we may desire to call it, the powerful and intimate love between two men appears in a multitude of texts as far back into the deeps of time as we can glance, and often at the moment of a hero's final departure. Um, here are some examples. The Iliad, the Epic of Gilgamesh, Sir Gerwin and the Green Knight, and Beowulf. And the use of a term such as homoamory could simultaneously honor love, sex, and intimacy between people of the same gender while also acknowledging that our modern understandings of sexuality and gender are not applicable to other time periods. Which I think is fair. I think it's fair. Um, now that we've gone over all of this, who gives a fuck? Who cares? Um, and so what does it mean for our hobbits to be heroes and to be queer heroes? Um, why does that matter? Um, so, actually, let me, let me do this one first. Um, Jane Chance, uh, who's a well-known Tolkien scholar, um, has put out a lot of articles and books on Tolkien since the early 2000s, um, characterizes the prototypical Tolkienian queer, queer, queer role of the hero as other, unlikely, unsuitable, and always untrained and absurd. So the thing is, is that Tolkien, his heroes are the abject. Uh, it is the two you know, diminutive, kind of absurdly small and ridiculous, two little guys crawling through mortar. That's what the balance of the world weighs on. Aragorn, Aragorn himself says, uh, you know, these battles don't fucking matter. The battles that they're fighting, they do not matter. What matters is Sam and Frodo's quest. They are the heroes here. Um, and so we have another chance quote. Tolkien considers the role of the insignificant hobbits, Frodo and Sam, as metaphorically crucial to the saving of Middle-earth. In relation to the events of World Wars I and II that appeared to cast ordinary humankind as insignificant in the shaping of their outcome, Tolkien declares, Anyway, I myself saw the value of hobbits in putting earth under the feet of romance and providing subjects for ennoblement and heroes more praiseworthy than the professionals. So it was very important for Tolkien as, you know, during the World Wars, essentially, uh, I mean, agency had been just stripped from people. Um, the common man had no power, no choice uh, about what happened to them. Um, so the hobbits, as diminutive, weak, normal, ordinary, um, are important heroes. It is important that they are the ones who save the world. Uh, and here we have the ideal of love struggling against enormous odds with only a slim glimmer of hope and yet conquering. The intimacy and love between Frodo and Sam is the moral and emotional heart of the story which is capable of saving the world from evil. This is important to note that the ring would not have gotten into Mordor if Sam and Frodo did not fucking love each other as much as they did. I mean, Sam was essentially carrying Frodo up that mountain, keeping him from falling into, you know, like the... This, this wretched, wretched state of being, like Gollum, from being consumed by the ring. It was their love for each other that got them through Mordor. The world was saved by a deep, intimate love between two men. Friendship or queerness? Who cares? Uh, and why does it matter if, you know, why does it matter to read uh, queer characters within The Lord of the Rings? Um, so, context, uh, Lord of the Rings is actually, um, has been misappropriated by white supremacists, and this is for a specific reason. Um, so this is actually from my dissertation, which was on a different subject, but connected, kind of. Um, so I'll just read it out. Shiloh Carroll posits that popular understanding of the Middle Ages is of a homogenous culture with religiously dictated gender roles and has thus become a reprieve for those who view non-normative gender roles as a threat to the cultural order and yearn nostalgically for a time, however imaginary, when social roles were simpler. A historical understanding of the medieval era arose from Victorian thought as a way for Europeans to justify their supposed racial superiority over the peoples whose lands, resources, and bodies they violently exploited through imperialism and colonialism, and so Victorian race science and bioessentialist gender norms were transplanted into the Middle Ages. As a consequence, 
Uh, white supremacists and fascists weaponized the Middle Ages to justify their hatred of a variety of marginalized peoples. Um, so essentially, uh, medieval history is deeply misunderstood um, culturally. Uh, like, across the culture, this is true. We do view it um, as the, me the, the medieval era, as a time in which, kind of like a Game of Thrones sorts of time. That's how we see it. Uh, but that's ahistorical. Um, that's not how things were going down. I could go on at length and probably give you guys a lot of quotes from my dissertation, but I'm not going to. But what you need to know is that the medieval era is weaponized by white supremacists. Um, and this brings in medieval fantasy because medieval fantasy, intimately and inextricably connected in the current popular imagination with the Middle Ages, suffers the same problem with the same root due to the fact that fantasy literature plays an important role in the wider cultural reading of the medieval in Western societies. So people, when they see medieval fantasy um, media content, they assume that uh, the medieval era, um, that what they see in medieval fantasy is what it was like in the medieval era. Um, which is unfortunately why texts like the Lord of the Rings have been used, you know, misappropriated by white supremacists as a white supremacist text. So what the, the importance of understanding the Lord of the Rings, um, specifically uh, it being Tolkien, who was the father of modern fantasy and the uh, progenitor of all medieval fantasy, um, essentially, uh, is that we can take it from them if we make it gay. That was essentially my thesis, uh, kind of. Um, there was a lot more going on. But it's harder to misappropriate uh, a text like Lord of the Rings for white supremacist, homophobic, misogynistic, transphobic purposes um, if we are saying no. The point of Lord of the Rings is that it is the little people, it is to abject queer little men who love each other deeply that save the world. It is not the people fighting the wars, it is not the people with prejudices, it's the little guys. It's the little guys who love each other in a way that's frankly very homoerotic. Um, and that's why it matters. And this is just a thing. Um, here's a quote. Queer people have always existed. The words for us have changed, will always change, but our hearts are the same. When we look at history, we must follow breadcrumbs to find ourselves. Uh, because here's, okay, a point on this is that the thing is, is that because there was such a stigma against queerness and queer people, I mean, they were fucking hunting and killing us for a lot of history. Um, is that like, uh, there isn't a lot recorded about us that isn't like, explicitly very mean um and if queer people wanted to keep their heads they had to be really uh careful about it so our history is kind of erased um there's a lot of efforts right now and a lot of what my work does my work was with my dissertation was kind of unearthing medieval queer history which there is frankly a lot of my god those priests and nuns were real gay real trans too it was kind of wild um it's, it's hard for queer people to find ourselves in history. And so things like these, I don't know. It's nice to find yourself. Anyway, this is just a comic of two men during World War II. Uh, and then they're quoting Sappho. Um, it's a good comic, which I will, I will share. It made me cry. Anyway. The goat source. Yeah, Ostertag fucking rocks. Um... So yeah, that was my present that was my presentation. <laughs>